Okay, great. So um, welcome everyone to the Computability Theory and Applications Online Seminar. Uh, so this week, we're very happy to be joined by Valentina Harazana from George Washington University, who will tell us about the computable isomorphism problem. Valentina. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. So this topic falls into a category which is sometimes classified as computable uh, classification or computable characterization, but we're looking to describe a structure or they're looking to classify it up to some um, equivalence relation in which in this case it's isomorphism. So I will uh, present the whole framework for the field, uh, old results, and then some results which uh, I studied with my collaborators, including Stefan uh, uh, years ago, but it's uh, it just appeared online, uh, just got published. So as usual, we consider countable structures for computable languages, and we'll assume that domains are computable. So the difficulty will not be with the domain, but with the structure itself. And when we measure complexity of a structure A, we'll identify A with its atomic diagram. So that's just the set of all the atomic and negations of atomic sentences uh, with additional constants for the elements of the domain such that in groups like AI times AJ equals AK or AI times AJ does not equal something or in the ordered structures, uh, AM less than AM and so on. So this will be the same as uh, taking quantifier free diagram. So here formulas are effectively encoded with natural numbers. So D of A can be identified with, uh, with a set of natural numbers. And that set has a certain Turing degree, and we'll consider that to be the Turing degree of structure A. So we can here also deal with structures which are not computable, but we'll in particular be interested in computable structures, and those are ones that have Turing degree zero. So examples of computable structures, almost any nice uh, countable structure we can think of such as rationals with plus. We, if we think of a nice copy, free groups, some non-commutative groups, uh, finite structures, finite groups in particular, are cyclic groups of order Z, P, N to the N, P is a prime number, or uh, quasi-cyclic or proof for P group, Z, P infinity. Um, if we think of a nice copy that's also computable and many other groups that are formed using these groups, and ZP infinity, we can just think of it as a set of rational numbers between zero and one of the form some, some number over P to the K, but the addition is modulo one. So that's very, very algorithmic. Of course, the standard model of arithmetic, probably one of the most important uh, computable structures. Uh, also computable ordinals. So ordinal is computable if it's the order type of some computable while ordering. And computable ordinals form a countable initial segment of the ordinals. And here, omega 1 CK for Church Cleaney is the least non computable ordinal. So, those will be important as structures, but also as tool to, uh, to define formulas. So, every structure A, uh, so a structure A is computable if its characteristic function if the characteristic function of its atomic diagram D of A is computable. So that characteristic function can be found in the list of all partial computable functions. So it is some phi E um, and we, in the in effective enumeration of all partial computable functions, phi zero, phi one, and so on. So we call such E a computable index for A and we denote structure A by AE. So uh, not all numbers are indices for structures. So only some of these are total computable functions, which are characteristic functions of atomic diagrams of structures. So now if we, if K is a family of structures, it's a set of some, nat algebra, some natural algebraic class, which is closed under isomorphism. Then the index set of K denoted by I of K is a set of all computable indices for members of K. And the computable isomorphism problem for K uh, denoted by E of K is a set of all pairs I, J, where I and J are from I of K such that AI is isomorphic to AJ. So this is what we 
this is the set that codes computable isomorphism problem. So a seminal paper in this area is by Goncharov at night, uh, 2002. And uh, so they showed for a lot of uh, classes of structures that were C all the time, this, the index set is relatively low in arithmetical hierarchy. In particular, it's pi zero two for linear orders, Boolean algebras, equivalent structures, abelian P groups, vector spaces over some computable field, for example, the field of rational skew. So here we're not interested in exactly calibrating this uh, index set, but as long as it's low in the, in the hierarchy, uh, that is good. But in the case of, uh, of the isomorphism problem, we'd also like to, uh, to calibrate it exactly. So we have the notion of completeness. By completeness, we mean M completeness, many one completeness. So C is some complexity class, and we say a set uh, S is C complete, it belongs to that class. And also every other set X in that class is uh, reducible to S via a computable function F. That means for every X, small X belongs to, to set X, if and only if F of X belongs to S. So this is M complete, but will suppress M. So uh, Calvert showed that for some structures, the, the, the isomorphism problem is also fairly low in the arithmetical hierarchy. For example, for Q vector spaces, uh, or this Q can be replaced by any computable, other computable field, E of K is pi zero complete. For equivalent structures, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, it is pi zero four complete. And uh, it follows as a byproduct of one of our papers, but it may have been contained in, in, in other literature, or maybe just part of folklore. Covered also show for algebraically closed fields of fixed characteristics. So we keep putting constraints on these uh, fields. So the isomorphism problem is pi zero three complete. So somehow we can identify uh, the isomorphic structures without actually searching for the isomorphism, which will involve the existing F where F is an isomorphism. So algebraically closed field uh, can be described by uh, as follows, for every n greater or equal than one, and then for every tuple x1 to x0, there is uh, y, which is the solution of the equation uh, x to the n times y to the n plus x n minus one times y n minus one and so on, plus x1 times y plus x0 equals zero, if x n is not zero. So this kind of begs for uh, an infinitary formula, the description of this structure because we have for every n and then for, uh, so the, also every field has a unique characteristic, which is either some prime P or zero, and that can also be described by a formula. So a field has characteristic P, if we add one P times, then uh, P one is uh, zero. And it's characteristic zero if for all primes, or so for every prime P, P1 does not equal zero. This also begs for an infinitary formula. Covered also showed a slightly different result, but it's kind of same level, third level of arithmetical hierarchy, that for uh, torsion-free abelian groups of a fixed finite rank. So again, we have here constraint on these groups, fixed finite rank, the E of K is sigma zero three complete. So a group is torsion-free if all elements have infinite order, Again, for every n, if x is a non-zero element, if that's an abelian group, then nx is not zero. And we can think of torsion-free abelian groups of finite rank n as subgroups of q to the n with respect to plus. So we can, uh, there's an easier way to search for an isomorphism than just to go through, through the actual isomorphic uh, functions, for functions which are isomorphisms. So we see from the previous uh, examples that computable structures in many familiar classes can be described by a computable formula. Computable formulas are infinitary formulas. Just the way uh, countable structures can be described by L omega one omega formulas. While L omega one omega formulas allow arbitrary countable disjunction and conjunctions, Computable formula is just a fragment of this that allow only computably enumerable conjunctions and computably enumerable disjunctions. And uh, 
the exact definition is complicated and involves the ordinary notation, but roughly we can say uh, computable pi alpha formula. See, I, alpha is a computable ordinal, alpha less than omega one CK is a C conjunction of formulas for all the U psi of X U. And then each such psi is some computable sigma beta formula for beta less than alpha. And then what about computable sigma beta formulas? Well, they now see these junctions of formulas. There exist V theta Y V, but now each theta is a computable pi gamma formula for some gamma less than beta. And can be different gammas for different thetas. And then we go to zero. So computable sigma zero or pi zero formula is a finitary quantifier free formula. So a computable sigma one formula would be just infinite disjunction uh, over some index set i, which is computably enumerable of formula, existential formulas. There exist ui, sigma, I, and then x, ui bar. So this is formula with variables x bar. It's kind of the simplest infinitary formulas. So hyperarithmetical structures that satisfy the same computable sentences are isomorphic. So computables in particular, um, I will define what hyperarithmetical is. In particular, computable structures that satisfy the same computable sentences are isomorphic. Just the way the countable structures that satisfy the same L1 omega, L omega 1 omega sentences are isomorphic. So a computable pi two sentence describing an abelian P group would be conjunction of all the axioms for abelian groups and the, and the formula for all X and then uh, infinite disjunction over M and then X added to X P to the M times is zero. So it just, uh, tells about the order of, of each element. So sigma n zero and pi n zero hierarchy can be extended to pi alpha zero and sigma alpha zero sets where alpha is now computable ordinal. So uh, arithmetical hierarchy can be extended to so-called hyperarithmetical hierarchy. And there are, um, several equivalents how to do that. Uh, they're very nice equivalents from different angles of computability theory. But uh, a set is hyperarithmetically, it can be defined in the standard model of arithmetic by a computable formula. So that could be uh, in um, Antonio's new book that's taken as a definition of what it means to be hyperarithmetical. And a set is pi zero alpha, if it's definable in N by a computable pi alpha formula. So when we say computable, we assume infinitary. Um, I will not use the superscript, some people use C. And similarly, as said, is pi zero alpha, it can be, if it's definable in the standard model of arithmetic by a computable sigma alpha formula. So in the paper, Goncharov and Knight proved that the following is equivalent, that there is a computable sentence, the computable models of which are exactly the computable structures in K. So uh, K here is a family of structures closed under isomorphism. So these uh, computable models can be kind of described by a computable sentence, and that's equivalent to index set of K being hyperarithmetical. So uh, proof from one to two uses uh, a fact due to Ash that the relation defining a computable structure A by a computable sigma alpha formula is sigma zero alpha. And it's also held uniformly with regard to the ordinal notation that's used in the definition. And the relation defining any computable structure by a computable pi alpha formula is pi zero alpha. What's interesting here is that if alpha equals N, the, we still get the same set, sigma zero n, pi zero n, in spite of using uh, infinitary formula, so kind of more powerful formulas. The other direction of this proof, where we assume the die of k is hyperarithmetical and you come up with a computable sentence, uses uh, barvis kreisel compactness theorem, which says if gamma is a pi one one set of computable sentences, and every um, delta one one subset has a model, then gamma has a model. So here we can think of delta one one as being hyperarithmetical. And I'll describe shortly, I'll recall what pi one one means. 
In particular, if gamma is a sigma one one, is a pi one one set of computable sentences, and every delta one one subset of gamma has a computable model, then gamma has a computable model. We often use that version. So I said hyperarithmetical hyper sets are the same as delta one one sets, where here superscript one indicates that there are function variables in addition to element variables. And as usual, a set uh, X uh, viewed as a unary relation, X of X is delta one one, if it can be expressed both in a sigma one one form and in a pi one one form. So we can think of sigma one one form as uh, having only existential uh, function quantifiers. So here the notion of computable involves also function quantifiers. Um, so if, uh, sigma one one form also has a normal form, there exists f and then number quantifier for all the y, and then some relation which involves f, x, and y. So f is here used as an oracle. So f of x equals something that would be computable. Similarly, pi one one form is a form which uses only universal function quantifiers, and the normal form is for all g, then there exists x, x is a number, and then some computable relation involving S, X, and G. So not all structures have index set, which is hyperarithmetical. For example, it follows from Kleene's and Spector's work that uh, for well orderings or for reduced abelian P groups, so those are the ones that don't have uh, divisible non-trivial subgroups. Uh, the index set is pi one one complete. Hence, it is not hyperarithmetical. So uh, we are interested uh, in the case when the index set is hyperarithmetical. And if the index set is hyperarithmetical, then the, um, is the computable isomorphism problem is sigma 1, 1. Um, that's the most complicated uh, case because we can always say there exists an F and then F is an isomorphism and that's sigma 1, 1 form. So we don't want our index set to be more complicated. Uh, we want it to be simpler than the isomorphism problem so that we have a proper setup for the problem. And Goncharov and I proved that for a graph for a billion P groups, uh, those are groups where every, uh, we just discussed them. And for us, for example, for arbitrary structures that have at least one relation of, of length at least two, the isomorphism problem is sigma one one complete. So the most complicated. It follows from work of Freeman and Stanley um, where we deal with, uh, with Borel completeness, but it follows that uh, with some modifications then for linear orderings, for Boolean algebras, for trees, and for fields of some fixed characteristic, could be zero or P, the isomorphism problem is sigma one one complete. So if we don't put additional restrictions on the fields, then it's uh, the most complicated isomorphism problem. And then a more recent really nice result due to Downey and Montalban that for torsion-free abelian groups, the isomorphism problem is sigma one one complete. So here we didn't put the restriction on the rank and uh, there was a, previous result by Culver that if it's a finite rank, then it's um, it's sigma zero three complete. And I think down in Montauban also did, if we restrict to infinite rank, then it's pi zero three complete. So if there is no restriction, then it's the most complicated problem. And in a recently published paper with uh, Stefan Lamb, Charlie McQuandre, Marozov, and Reed Solomon, we have, uh, um, show that for distributive lattices, nilpotent rings, nilpotent semigroups, and two-step nilpotent groups, the isomorphism problem is sigma one one complete. So we focus on nilpotent structures, rings, semigroups, and groups. We also did it for lattices, although we already have the result for Boolean algebras, both from Friedman Stanley, and also there is a direct proof uh, using trees in uh, Goncharov and Knight. But, um, our proof is uh, uh, different and it's simpler. So we just included it for that sake. 
So what properties do such structures have which have the most complicated uh, isomorphism problem, computable isomorphism problem? So by A isomorphic with subscript hype B, we didn't know that there is a hyperarithmetical isomorphism from A to B. So it's not hard to deduce the following corollary, corollary that in each of the above classes of structures with sigma one one complete computable isomorphism problem, we have the following phenomena, following examples. There are two computable structures A and B that are isomorphic, but they're not hyperarithmetically isomorphic. Also, there is a single computable structure that has uh, two finite tuples of elements of the same length, A and B, so that MA is isomorphic to MB, but MA is not hyperarithmetically isomorphic to MB. So here A gets mapped into B. Um, and also there is a computable structure of high Scott rank. High Scott rank means a Scott rank which is greater or equal than omega one CK. So it's either omega one CK or omega one CK plus one. So then there are many equivalent ways to define Scott rank, but probably the easiest way to understand is via computable formulas. So the Scott rank is less than omega one CK, so kind of low computable. If there is a computable ordinal alpha, so that the orbits of all tuples are defined by computable pi alpha formulas. So there's some kind of uh, level alpha so that for each tuple, its orbit under, iso under automorphism is defined by a computable pi alpha formula. So having Scott rank greater or equal than CK is just the negation of this statement. So there are two things that can happen. Either there is some tuple, the orbit of which is not definable by any computable formula. In that case, we have omega one CK plus one, or the orbits of the tuples are definable by computable formula, but there's no computable bound on the complexity of this formula. They go higher and higher, and that's when it's exactly omega one CK. And those are uh, hard examples to find. So here it doesn't distinguish, high Scott rank is just greater or equal than CK. So the method we used to establish our isomorphism results for these nilpotent structures and lattices is based on uniform effective interpretation of computable binary relations um, or fields. Those are known structures uh, with the uh, sigma one one complete isomorphism problem into computable structures from the corresponding algebraic classes. Now that method was used in another seminal paper by Hirschwell, Hussein, Offshore, and Slinko where they transfer Turing degree spectra of structures and relations, computable dimension, and other computability theoretic properties from known structures to new structures. Uh, the new structures are kind of familiar structures and the known structures could sometimes be very strange structures. So the motivation here, their motivation in our case is when certain structures with particularly interesting computability theoretic properties are found, we ask whether similar examples can be found in other classes of structures. So the general approach here is to encode st known structures, structures with known properties into structure in a given new class, hopefully some natural class, in a way that's algorithmic enough to preserve desired properties. So we use their method, but we, with a focus on the uh, isomorphism where isomorphism doesn't allow introduction of constants. Uh, for some of these computability theoretic properties, additional constants don't matter, but in our case they do because then it will be isomorphism that map points into sp other points, specific points. So here is sketch for the isomorphism problem for nilpotent groups. So we use the, an old idea of Maltsev who transformed rings to groups. So we uh, so k uh, script k here is a countable infinite ring with one, and the Heisenberg group uh, G of k is just a three by three matrix. Is uh, the group of three by three matrices, which have one on the main diagonal, zero below, and then three numbers above a, b, and c. C is in the corner, so they determine by these triples of elements a, b, c. And it's easy to see that if we multiply them, we get the 
matrix of the same kind. So we get, uh, if we start with A0, B0, C0, and A1, B1, C1, we get A1 plus A0 plus A1, B0 plus B1, and then C0 plus C1 plus A0, B1. And then the identity matrix is just A, B, and C are zeros. And the inverse matrix is uh, A goes into minus A, B minus B, and then uh, the third component is A, B minus C. So the commutator uh, of these matrices, H0 and H1, uh, that's just H0 times H1 times H0 inverse H1 inverse. But when we multiply uh, these matrices, we get H0, 0, and then determinant. The first column is A0, B0 from the first matrix, and the second column is A1, B1 from the second matrix. So it's not hard to see the center of this group, which is the set of all matrices um, that converge, with, that commute with any, with any other. The, the center is just the matrices where A and B is zero, and we have C in the corner. So the matrices are of the form zero, zero, and then C in the corner, um, and C is just the, any element of K. And from here, we can see that uh, the commutator of the whole group with itself is the center, which means that this is a nilpotent group of nilpotent C2 or meta abelian group sometimes called. Uh, so the lower central series is the group and then the center and then the trivial group one. Okay, but what if we start with the field instead of the ring? So if we start as a field with a field, then we can also divide and we can factor out elements. So if um, A0, uh, B1 is not exactly zero, zero, then the commutator of two matrices given by A0, B0, C0, and A1, B1, C1 is one, um, that means they commute, even only if there is some alpha from the field so that the, the column A1, B1 is alpha times the column A0, B0. So now we choose two non-commuting matrices. Say we fix two non-commuting matrices, W0 and W1. And here we have a great choice. We can choose, uh, we have a choice, but uh, probably the simplest is, so we have to choose any one where this determinant is not zero, A0, B0, A1, B1. Probably the easiest are one, we, uh, one and then zeros and then zero, one, zero. So the ones where, a is one and B and C are zero. And then another one where um, A is zero, B is one and C is zero. So that's one where this determinant is one. So that would be the easiest. So here is W zero and W one. So we have zero in the, in the upper corner. So we're gonna use this, uh, two matrices to interpret the field F into the Heisenberg group G of F. And it's exactly in the center in uh, that upper corner that will define the fields operations. Let's call them plus and times in a circle so that there'll be a field isomorphism between F and the center Z of G of F. So this isomorphism will map delta from the field F into a matrix zero, zero, say delta, if we chose D to be one. But this is more general if we just uh, use uh, any determinant D that's not zero. So, so we'll be able to recover the field from that uh, corner, upper corner of the matrix. So how do we define the field in the center of this group? So if uh, X and Y are two elements from the center, X is given by alpha and Y is given by beta, the others are zero. Then we can define plus as just uh, the product of X times Y. Because when we multiply these two matrices, we have that at the very beginning, we get uh, 
we add zero and zero, zero and zero, and here we add alpha plus beta, and there will be another factor, which is zero. So we just exactly get alpha plus beta, the addition of the field, especially in our case, if we chose D to be one. The multiplication is not so easy to define, and there was some formula in Maitsev and then in further Morozov's work, but uh, formula, so now we need a third uh, element, gamma. So gamma is the, the third matrix given by H00 uh, gamma, or we can just think of gamma. So we want a formula which will be true if and only if um, where X times Y, this new Y uh, times in a circle, and here we just indicate that depend that it uses W0 and W1 equals Z, if and only if alpha beta equals gamma. In the previous case, we wrote uh, W0, W1, but we didn't really use W0 and W1. Here we do. So there is a, such a formula uh, which is equivalent to alpha beta equals gamma and thus establishes the, the isomorphism, um, the homomorphism with respect to, to times in the field. And the formula is X times in a circle Y equals Z. Um, if and only if there exists X prime, Y prime, so that the commutator of X, X prime with W zero and Y prime with W one is one, so they commute. And then X is obtained as X as a commutator of X prime W one. This is how we kind of define this X prime. And then y uh, and y is the commutator of w zero y prime in slightly different order, and z is x commutator of x prime y prime. So the result here z will be the commutator of x prime y prime, and they satisfy these conditions. So this requires proof. So it's not that obvious, but that gives us the following fact: if uh, f zero and f one are fields, and if the the group G of F0 is isomorphic to G of F1, then we can conclude that F0 is isomorphic to F1. I mean, the other direction is obvious. And you also, the, we had a very algorithmic way of defining this uh, matrices. Now we're using a friedman stanley result that a computable isomorphism problem for fields is sigma 1, 1 complete, um, fields of some fixed characteristics, say 0 or P. And now we can conclude that a computable isomorphism problem for Heisenberg group is sigma one one complete and they are nilpotent groups. So I want to uh, give some proof sketch for distributive lattices. So in this case, the reduction was from a single binary relation omega R. So that's, that's one where if we have a, at least one relation of, of arity, at least R, then that structure has sigma one one complete isomorphism problem and to distributive lattices L of R. And we use some vague idea from a handwritten paper by Rabin and Scott. So our, uh, how do we build, so we start with this relation R and how do we build the, uh, how do we build the, uh, our uh, lattice. So it will be a lattice of sets where subset is the relation, uh, the intersection is infimum, the union is supremum. But what are the elements? So we start with two infinite disjoint sets, and that's the idea from Rabin and Scott. So uh, denote their elements by AIs and BIs. And then we partition B into uniformly computably infinite sets. Uh, indexed by pairs, by pairs of uh, different elements. X, uh, you, we can call this B, X, Y. So we do this in a uniform computable way. So that uh, when X and Y are the same, so the same as ZT, then the corresponding sets will be the same. So if uh, X, Y are the same as ZT, and they have to be different, X is different from Y, Z is different from T, then these sets are the same. Otherwise, they're disjoint. So we'll uh, assume that our relation is irreflexive and symmetric and infinite. So these are just some assumptions that we can uh, take. 
And then uh, for technical reasons, we also need to assume that the domain of R has at least two, three elements. The domain is the first component of the relation. And now we'll uh, effectively define a lattice, which will consist of subsets of A and B. And that will automatically assure that this lattice is distributive. And so this lattice will be generated by the following elements. We'll take all uh, one element sets, therefore all finite subsets of A union B. Then set A itself will be an element of the lattice. So far, we haven't used the relation R. So it's the third part that connects relation R with our lattice. So if X and Y are R related, then we'll take a set UXY, which will take elements AX and AY, and union set BXY. So two elements from A and this strip from B, this uh, infinite, uh, this. Uh, piece of, of B, which is indexed by X, Y. So every element in this lattice is the union of, of finite sets, finitely many one element sets, finitely many of these sets, U, X, I's, and possibly A as a single set. We can even omit one element sets that are contained in other sets. For example, if an element A is contained in, in set A or, or elements are contained in B or, so we can obtain some canonical representation. So this is how we build a computable lattice LR. Now we are obviously, if we for omega R0 is isomorphic to omega R1, then LR0 will be isomorphic to LR1. But now we have to show, um, the opposite, if we assume that the lattices which correspond to R0 and R1 are isomorphic, then the relations will be isomorphic. So one way to show this that we use this, that R is definable from the lattice, um, either, uh, and then intermediate steps in definability, either by finite or an infinite formula. In this case, the formulas turn out to be finite. So the way how we interpreted uh, um, field into the center of the group. In the previous example, here we have to interpret the relation R into our lattice. So we do this gradually. First, um, the atoms are exactly one element sets and we can define those or can, uh, define this just exactly one Y, such that Y is not X and Y is less or equal than X. We denote the least element by zero. And then, uh, also, there is a first order formula, which in the lattice defines elements that are non-empty unions of possibly some UMNs and maybe A. So they don't contain uh, um, these finite sets, which are outside of, which are not part of A and UMNs. So we can also uh, express that by a formula. And then theta star X will define minimal elements satisfying that formula. So that would be just either A or just a single U uh, M N. Now this allows us to define A by a first order formula, say alpha of X. So that's fairly easy. So uh, theta star of X, so it's, it's like a minimal element. So it's either A and it's one or B, B is with uh, indexed by two numbers. And for every other y, which is not x, but it's also minimal in this sense, the intersection of x intersection y is greater than exactly two atoms. So here we need the fact that the domain of R has at least three elements, because otherwise we won't be able to distinguish between A and the single uh, BMN. So now we can actually recover, if we, we can recover R, and that means if L of R0 is isomorphic to L of R1, then omega R0 will be isomorphic to omega R1. So uh, R is isomorphic to the relation that can be defined in LR by the formula, say, psi of XY with subscript R. So we had there AX and AY where R uh, is uh, 
where X and Y are related by um, here, AX and AY, so that we have RXY. Only for those where R, we have RXY. So this AX, AY, they kind of isomorphic to the, to the, relate, to the relation with XY. So we basically say X is less or equal than A, and Y is less or equal than A. That means they belong to they belong to A. X is not a Y, and there exists some U which is minimal uh, element satisfying theta theta star. U is not A, so that means it's one of those uh, U's uh, which is B union two of the A's. And X is less or equal than U and Y is less or equal than U. So that's just a proof sketch. What about for nilpotent rings? I would just uh, briefly describe uh, what we have uh, because here the proofs are uh, uh, more involved and definability is more complicated. And we're actually using infinitary, computable infinitary formula. So first we effectively transform a computable binary relation into a computable binary relation, let's call this second one R, which satisfies certain combinatorial condition, which we'll use to, to draw conclusions about certain expressions in the ring. So combinatorial condition in the sense that we have this kind of connections between various uh, uh, elements. And then uh, this new relation R will be transformed into a commutative ring, which will be nilpotent uh, A of R. So the definition is not so clear for rings what the nilpotent is. Here we just assume it will be nilpotent because R cube will be just a trivial ring. So we just assume that R to the N is uh, zero. That's the definition we take here. So we fix the elements. We have uh, two distinct elements, A, B, and then we have infinitely many elements, C0, C1, C2, and so on. So the ring will consist of linear of expressions of the form some integer M, A. So either we're either adding A or subtracting or taking the opposite of A plus N, B, where N is also an integer. And then some finite sum of Z, I, C, I over some index set i, which is finite. So these are, these are the elements of the ring. This is how we multiply. We set a lot of, uh, have a lot of zeros. Basically for every x, a times x will be zero and b times x will be zero. Ci times cj will try to capture the relation r. So this is where we have connection between r and our ring. So ci, cj will be b, exactly when i and j are, are related. And it will be a if they're equal, ci square will be a. And if it's not related, uh, and if it's not equal, then it will be zero. So pretty soon we get that x, y times z is zero, and then x times parentheses y times z is zero. So we get associativity, and also this is, we get nil potency because our, our cube is basically zero. And then we show how we can recover B or plus minus B, and then how we can recover A in terms of defining the structures. And so basically we show that we can interpret R in AR. So if the rings are isomorphic, AR zero and AR one, then we get that the relation is isomorphic. Omega R zero is isomorphic to omega R one. And then we have a similar construction for semigroups. So there is also a, a general result, um, another way to look at, the, at a classification problem and the complexity of the computable isomorphism problem. It involves enumerations, because so far we had index sets and we had uh, definability by computable formulas. There's also enumeration. So now the K, um, bold face K is the, is the family of structures. Um, 
closed under isomorphisms. And the Friedberg enumeration of computable structures from this family K module isomorphism relation denoted by K comp slash uh, isomorphism is a sequence of computable structures, C0, C1, and so on, which represent each isomorphism type from K exactly once. Um, so if it's not exactly once that's just enumeration, basically Friedberg is used for one one enumeration. And then the complexity of this enumeration will be the complexity of the sequence of computable indices uh, for the structures um, see from all of these structures. So, um, Goncharov and Knight, and later added by Culvert in the Bulletin for Symbolic Logic paper, established the equivalence of the following three statements. So here we assume that again, the index set is hyperarithmetical, index set of K. So the computable isomorphism problem, E of X is hyperarithmetical, um, is equivalent to there is a hyperarithmetical Friedberg enumeration of computable structures from K. Um, modulo isomorphism relation tilde. So that was in the original paper, but that third uh, definability uh, item was added later. There's also computable ordinal alpha such that any two computable structures in K satisfying the same computable pi alpha sentences are isomorphic. So there's this kind of limit on this computable ordinal alpha and um, which gives definability. So if we take negations of three statements, then we have the computable isomorphism problem is not hyperarithmetical, and then there's no such a Friedberg enumeration, and there's no such a computable ordinal alpha. So we have these basically these three approaches, the kind of uh, index sets and um, Friedberg enumeration and definability using computable uh, formula computable sentences that, that uh, apply to computable structures, which are sometimes called uh, pseudo-Scott sentences. And those three approaches are equivalent. And that's all I had. Thank you.